How's everyone doing this morning? Great. All right, praise God. Um, good to um, have us all here this Sabbath morning. Uh, <clears throat> this morning, Val was going over bread and cells, you know, about taking care of the natural body. And taking care of the natural body without taking care of the spiritual body, is, is dis- is, you're just destroying the work in which you're doing. Amen? You have to, ju- Jesus says, man shall not live by the natural alone, but by what? Every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He didn't literally say natural, but he was talking about natural bread. Amen? So we're not to live by just the natural things, but by every word. It's every word that makes a natural thing even have life. So it's a waste of time to enjoy natural food and not have a greater desire for the spiritual food. Amen? Amen. And because Christ gave up the natural food that we might get the, the blessing of the spiritual food. Amen? So. Amen. I pray that as we go through this, these thoughts this morning that we, we would all be blessed. But I, I just ask this one thing, um, maybe a few things. But we, I, this is Sabbath school. We do encourage talking, questions, comments, statements. We do encourage it. But one thing I ask, let's try to keep them brief and have our question and statement formed and yeah, to pertain into the subject and, and, and ask it. Um, so that way, you don't. You, an idea might come, and you might not have it formed, and you stop the presenter, and he gives up his thought to listen to you to form your thought, and that just takes away, and and then too much time is lost in between. Amen. Amen. So we just ask that form your thought, form your question, put it together, raise a hand, then ask, and so that we it, we can just keep that 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 flow going like a blood flow. Amen? Amen. So let us open up with a silent word of prayer. Amen. All right. Once again, happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Uh, last week, for those who are here, those who followed, we were looking at Matthew 24. Um, and, and Matthew 24 is, is a wonderful chapter. And it's a chapter that every Christian on planet Earth, everyone that professes the name of Christ should understand. And, and it, I mean, it's easily you can open up a Bible if you have one, if one is in your possession. And you can just you can just read those words and 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 by the grace of God, maybe the, the Holy Spirit will impress you of the importance of those words. You may not fully understand it, but you will be hopefully led to see the importance of those words that are that are uh, that Christ is, is saying to us. Matthew 24, Mark 13 and Luke 21. And last week we were going over the from verse four down to verse 20. But we we stopped in actually verse um, 15, 15 to 19. And, and I'm going to pick. That was just dealing with the first part of the sign. The disciples asked two questions. But before I go into that, I just want to ask this because it's Sabbath school. What is the purpose of prophecy? What is its goal? What, what, what does Christ intend by giving prophecy? To foretell future events. To foretell future events, to guide. What else? It, it's the most important one. To help the, us be better prepared. Huh? To help us to be better prepared. So y'all gave me three things. It's to foretell. It's to guide to help us to be better prepared, and salvation. But, say it again. Salvation. That's the most important one because Rule 14 says the most important rule of all that we have what? Faith. faith. Proph- if prophecy does not lead us to have faith, it did not do its job. Amen? Amen. That's where I was going. John 14, 29. The whole purpose of prophecy is to make someone believe the very words that are being uttered to them. Amen? What does it mean to believe? What does it mean to have faith? What does it mean to believe? We're going to keep going in circles until you actually give me the substance like the bread that gives me the life. Just saying this is bread, it means nothing unless you what? Eat it. So just saying this is the word of God means nothing unless you what? Live it. Amen. Live it. Yes, we need to go. F- Amen. We, that means we have to understand what believe means then. Amen. That's where we go. Amen. Amen. Show me thy faith by your what? 
works. I know you believe something when I see the fruits that follow that belief. The whole purpose of prophecy is to lead someone to do exactly what the word itself said. Amen? If you don't do what it says, prophecy failed in your life. God's prophecy didn't fail. It failed for you. Amen? And we don't want it to fail for us. I have these three blocks up here, right? Um, these three blocks. Uh, just follow along with me for this simple illustration. If I were to say to everyone here that these three blocks were gold, how would y'all look at me? Huh? I'm mad. But say I'm a Christian and I say these three blocks are gold, how would y'all then look at me? Huh? You, my profession, will lead you to believe what I said. Amen? Because a Christian should tell no what? No lies. So if I say this is gold, and you would take me seriously if I, if I say I'm a Christian, you're liable to believe what I said. Amen? It, it's true. I mean, Christ says false prophets are going to come and deceive many because they say they're Christians. And people are going to believe it. Believe them simply on them saying it. Is that how Christ wants us to live? No. no. Amen. I have to prove to you that this is really indeed gold. So now, can gold melt in fire? Yes. Huh? Yes. But how hot must the fire be? Very hot. very hot. So if I put it in limited fire, and that it's not very hot to melt the gold, and the gold will remain, but the paint that's covering this gold, what would melt? The paint. And then you would see this is what? So if I take this, catch this from Mario, and throw it in a fire that doesn't burn the gold, it just burns the paint, and now gold manifests, how liable are you now to believe me? And how valuable do these two remaining ones become? So that's God's word. When he gives us a prophecy and the prophecy comes to pass, it's gold. And it's designed to make his word so valuable. And just look how much our interest will now be in these two blocks because these are really gold. You would stretch your hands out to me and want these things, right? So God expects when we see prophecy comes to pass, we would stretch our hands out to Christ and desire these things so that he would give it to us. Amen? Amen. Matthew 24 is designed to lead people to stretch their hands out to Christ so that he can teach them and prepare them for what's coming. The whole purpose of Matthew 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 is to keep the Christian in a constant state of watching and earnest preparation for Christ's second coming. Amen? That's, that's, that's what it's designed to do. And this is what we're going to look at this morning um, as we continue. Last week, we, we went over the destruction of Jerusalem. The disciples asked two things. They said, Lord, what is, when is the, Jerusalem going to be destroyed? And what is the sign of your coming? And this is what we're going to look at at this time. And I pray that um, it, would, it, would in, it would encourage us to look for the signs that are actually literally taking place around us. The only reason we don't see it is because just like these blocks... Satan has covered prophecy with paint, and the only way to remove the prophecy, we must go into God's word so that God's word would burn off the deception that Satan has used to hide from us the fulfillment of Bible prophecy. So God's word is that fire that consumes deception so we can see the gold, that fulfillment of prophecy, and then our desire for God's word would increase. Amen? Amen. So if we don't go into God's word and allow him to remove the paint, that Satan has constructed and put over the events that are taking place and blinding people from seeing the fulfillment of prophecy, we, our souls won't be nourished by that bread that God wants it to be nourished by. So let us take a look at some of these things. I love these picture right here, as you can see. This was something that NASA released this week, and, and I thought it was, it was very fitting for the subject in which we're looking to, the signs of Christ's second coming, because these things in which they're seen in the heavens, they're failing to see that these are just signs of Christ's second coming. Amen? Yeah. What did Christ say in Matthew 24? There'll be signs where? In the heaven. Signs is something you see. And they are what? Seeing something. But they can't read the thing in which they're seeing. Well, when we go into the Bible, it will help. It will, the Bible will interpret for us the very things our eyes is looking upon so that we can understand what's taking place around us. Go ahead. Mm, not so much, no. Yeah. That light is really there's bright. A, there's a picture of Jesus up there and he brought that up. Um, the fire. Yes. If someone don't go through the fire, it can't be of us a prophet. 
Amen. Before people started having that love, and I only raise that to say is, this is what we are. We're going to have to go through this fire. That's why the scientists can't understand the science. No one has, they, they've not seen the goal because, because God's people are not demonstrating Amen. that they've been through the fire and that these things need to be, so, so by God's grace, we have to recognize if he's teaching this, it's going to take us through the fire. Amen. Because yes, it is. Amen. The thing that people look at and stretch their hand out for these problems. We need to become the goal to the people, in yes. other words. Amen. And the Bible does say that God's going to put us in the fire so that people do see the goal. Amen. Amen. That, but he's not going to make the fire hot to burn the goal. The fire is just hot to burn the rubbish that's covering the goal. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. The, the hot fire that burns gold, that's the lake of fire. That one is going to burn up those that refuse to allow Christ to cleanse them. Amen? Amen. And we don't want that. We don't want to be in that fire. That one destroys all elements. Um, let's go on. In, in the notes, I have here a recap. Last week, we went over uh, Matthew 24. We saw that it was a destruction that was coming upon Jerusalem. Jerusalem was a large city that the, that the people lived in. And Christ gave them a prophecy that was indicating to them signs that would let them know when that destruction was near. And, it, and, it's, and it's Matthew chapter 4, verse 4 to 14. And we stopped off from 15 to 20, where the, the last of that sign for Jerusalem was the, the siege of Jerusalem, um, where Cestia surrounded Jerusalem, which was the final sign that was to be given to them just before Titus came and destroyed it. And we went over, if we remember the history of Nero, which I love, Nero was the last, the last Julio emperor, Julio something emperor of Rome. Of a, he, he was the last in the line of Caesar Augustus. Yeah. Caesar Augustus was the, I mean, Julius was there, but the real emperor was Augustus because he ruled the world at that time. Julius prepared the way for that. Amen. That's what Julius did, and Augustus began to rule. Nero is from that line, and he was the last one that died in 68 BC. And when he died, Vespasian came over. Do you know what they said when Nero died? It was the time of four emperors. They were four emperors were striving for the time for the for the for the seat of Rome. And Vespasian was one that came out. What prophecy comes to mind when you hear that? Daniel 11, Daniel 11 what? Three. 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 Amen. Yes. Yeah, so there's a there was a change in the government of Rome when Nero died. It was no longer in the straight line of Caesar Augustus. It was now it was a regular Roman that ended up becoming emperor at that time. All of that was a sign because Christ says, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, emperors against emperors. So that was like the last stance for the Christians that was there to do what? Leave. To leave. They, they had to leave. You had to get out because Vespasian is going to come back once he becomes emperor. And that's the first thing Vespasian did when he became emperor. Guess what it was? He sent Titus straight to Jerusalem. That was because he wanted to set some remarkable thing that would make his name prominent. And he wanted, and what, what was suggested to him was to take Jerusalem because it was very hard to take Jerusalem. So any, Jerusalem was a very hard city to defeat. Yes, it was, a, it was a walled fortress. That's why the disciples, when Christ says not one stone to them, how can these things be? How is, but Christ says, I'm telling you the truth, not one stone is going to be left up on another. Jerusalem will be thrown down. Why was, why was it such a wall fortress? Because Jerusalem was set to be an example of Jerusalem in heaven. The, no one on earth couldn't overthrow Jerusalem on earth unless Christ gave them permission, which was designed to impress upon everyone's mind that the Jerusalem in heaven, nobody can overthrow that kingdom. Amen? And God wants us to be a part of that kingdom that doesn't get overthrown. So let us go on into our notes now. And we're going to... Go ahead. Last point. Um, um, he also um, he he fought against um, um yeah yeah um what what who um Vespasian yeah. okay his when excuse me when. When he came to rule, that 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 was a sign as well because he went and yes. um and, and 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 he fought against four emperors. No, four um, four cities. Yes, four. Go ahead. No, he fought against four cities. Yeah, it was um 
Yeah, Chosen, yeah, yeah. oh, Bethsaida, Bethsaida. and um, Chorazin, yeah. and um, I have two other names, yeah. but I think it's going to be yeah. Matthew 11, yeah. um, 20 or something like that. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't remember exactly the name, but yes, I, I know what you're talking because Christ says they were to be destroyed yeah. um, right along with Jerusalem because they rejected the, the, the Christ at that time. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I missed this. Well, it's all right. I'll probably get there. Um, I have in here Matthew, I'm going to go over that, Matthew 24, where the disciples ask Christ what will be the sign. And um, follow me with this next one. This is Matthew 23. I only put this in to show that Matthew 23 is, is tied to Matthew 24. And Matthew 24 came as a result of 23, when Christ pronounced the woes on, upon the Pharisees because he saw that they were going to kill him, that they rejected him as the Messiah, so he pronounced this woe upon them. Jump, jump down with, you can read this portion on your time. I just wanted to come down to these verses. Just look at me to verse 35, where Christ says, or verse 36, where he says, Verily I say unto you, all these things shall come upon this generation. Um, where Christ, I, this is the part I, I, I wanted to, to emphasize here. He says that the, right, the, the blood of Abel, all the way down to the blood of Zacharias, is going to be required of this nation. In that, the Lord was teaching us a lesson. And the lesson he was teaching us, when Cain killed Abel, what should have happened to Cain? They should have died. But what did God do? He held, he held back the evil. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when, so when Jerusalem, when, when their fathers killed all the prophets, did any of them die? No. no, God restrained all the evil that should have came upon them. When Nineveh sinned and Jonah went to Nineveh and preached to her, what did Nineveh do? Repent. And what did God say? All the evil that I thought to bring, I'm not going to bring. So all the evil, is, should the evil still come? Yeah. What does God do to those evil? He Hold bottles them, them up. Yeah. He holds them in a cup until the fourth generation. It's in the fourth generation where all the evils that should have came up in the first generation, the second generation, and the third and the fourth is together. The Lord pours all that evil upon that last generation. Why? Why does he do that? Does anyone know? What does the Bible say? God is what? What is God is? So why is he doing that? It's harder to save the people in the fourth generation. They need as much signs and evidence as they possibly can to lead them back to God. The children of Israel in Egypt, it was the fourth generation, the Bible says. Yeah. What, the Lord walked through there with ten plagues. All those plagues that came upon Egypt should have came upon Egypt in the first generation, in the second generation. But the Lord reserved them for that time to save the people of that time because their perception, their understanding of God was so darkened that he had to manifest more of his power in order to bring them out. If the Lord had killed everyone that committed sin right away, not too many people would believe. They would just say it's of natural causes. But if all those evils that God bottled up and he just made them follow one after the other, one after, one after the other, one after the other. But before he did that, he made sure Moses explained to the people the judgments that were coming so that nobody can say that these were of natural causes. But that the Lord himself brought them and he himself took them away because that was the time for Egypt to be punished and Israel to come out and somebody be saved. All of that was an illustration for the end of the world. At the end of the world, the character of people is going to be so terrible that the seven last plagues, it's only bottled up wrath that God should have poured out in other times in history, but he doesn't do it. He's going to do it at the end of the world. So that way he can save as many people as he possibly can by these judgments that he's going to bring. Amen? Amen. The Bible says when judgment is in the land, the people seek righteousness. Yeah, y'all follow? Amen. All right, go it's ahead. It's like the, the rain in Noah's time, uh, the antediluvians, it, it built up and built up in the clouds and it never rained. Amen. The Lord saved it. He held it up. He held it, he held yes. It up, yeah. Amen. And he gave them the strongest evidence he can give them, animals mm -hmm. coming onto the ark, lions walking next to the zebra and not killing it. All of these things he manifested before their eyes so that they can see on that, that what Noah is saying. Until this day, animals always seek the highest places when danger is coming. Mm -hmm. Amen? To, 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 to give us this warning. But going to Matthew 23, here's why the disciples ask. Let's jump down with me now to the last one in verse 38. It says, Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. For I say unto you, you shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. What is Christ talking about here in this last verse? 
He's telling them, you're not going to see me anymore until you see me come. Then you're going to say, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. If they're not going to see him anymore, then when are they going to see him? At the second coming. All we have to do is go to Revelation chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, every eye shall see him, even those that pierced him. So, they, so these people are to be resurrected so that they can see Christ coming. And that's what he's telling them. So the disciples, when they heard this, this was, this was a logical question for them to ask. And this next one, they asked him, Lord, when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? Because that's what Christ impressed upon their minds. And they were led to ask this question. So now I'm just going to read this. Uh, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And this is from Desire of Ages 680, 630. It says, from the destruction of Jerusalem, Christ passed on rapidly to the greater event, the last link in the chain of this earth's history, the coming of the Son of God in majesty and glory. Between these two events, there lay open to Christ's view long centuries of darkness, centuries for his church marked with blood and tears and agony. Upon these scenes, his disciples could not then endure to look, and Jesus passed them by with a brief mention. Why am I going over this? <clears throat> because in Matthew 24, the question was in Mark 13 and Luke 21, I keep stressing this, what the disciples asked was the destruction of Jerusalem. What was the sign for that? And then they asked, what is the sign of your coming? So, <clears throat> so Christ, he wasn't going to give them a list of things that were going to happen. What he was going to give them was just signs specifically to what they asked for. Amen? So Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21 are answers that come specifically to what the disciples asked for. Why is this important to us? Because when these things come to pass, it's designed for them that saw it to believe or for the people at the end of the world? For the people at the end of the world, because these are historical events. Um, now this next one. Now in unmistakable language, our Lord speak of, speaks of his second coming and gives warning of dangers to precede his advent to the world. Um, let's go to our next slide as we bring this up. The Savior gives signs of his coming, and more than this, he fixes the time when the first of these signs shall appear. What does he do? He fixes the time when the first of these signs shall appear. Notice, he jumps over history. He's only going to that point in history that reveals to us the sign of his coming. So when we come to the point where we recognize the first sign of Christ's coming, this is to indicate to the people living in that time, we are literally living in the generation that's going to see Christ come. So what do you think the people are going to do when, when his disciples begin to see these signs come to pass? They're really going to get themselves ready for that coming. Y'all follow? All right, so let's look at this. What is the first sign? Let, let's look at what Christ says. It says, um, he says, this is the, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. What tribulation is he talking about? Remember, he's not giving us a historical uh, uh, a prophecy leading us down. He's given us, us the signs of his coming. And he takes their mind to the place to look for the first sign. And he says, immediately after the tribulation. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. So then we would have to, what tribulation is he talking about? For sake of Bible study, I'm not going to go into that. Christ is pointing their mind to the 1260, the papal persecution. I want us to see what Christ just did. If you go into Matthew 24, which we're not going to look at right now, from verse 4 down to verse 20, Christ walks them through the destruction of Jerusalem. And he comes down to the end. Jerusalem is destroyed, right? So logically, if he reaches the end of the destruction of Jerusalem, that means he's finished with that explanation. He's finished with that one. So the next verse is not about Jerusalem. What is it going to be about? The, second coming. the sign of his coming. Yeah. So this is the second part to the question. The first part, what is the sign of Jerusalem's end? Well, Christ reaches the end. And the last verse is, see that your, your flight be not in the winter, nor on the Sabbath day. That's the last verse for the destruction of Jerusalem. And we were told last week that for 40 years, the disciples in Christ's day prayed that their flight wouldn't be on the Sabbath day, nor in the winter. Well, Jerusalem was destroyed. Now, the next thing the Christians is looking for is for the first sign of Christ coming. And it was the dark day. Amen? Which is right here. The dark day. This is what we're about to read. This is the sign that Christ gave. And just so that we don't confuse it, Christ says immediately after the tribulation. But what I want us to see, let's look at how, um, let us look at how another one of the disciples express it. Um, we're going to read Matthew 
for this point, and then we're going to look at how Mark says it. It says, for then shall be great tribulation, and go down to verse 22. Oh, I'm going to read the whole thing. Such as was not since, there, since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. All right, so let's go down to this. Let's look at how Mark now puts it. Um, I actually like how Mark says it. For in those days, oh, I'm sorry. It says, <coughs> yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. You have a TCM on that. Thank you. I don't know why it's doing that. No, I didn't touch it. I mean, it would make sense. <laughs> now it's going to do it again. Hopefully not. All right. It says, Mark says, for in those days shall be what? Affliction. Affliction. Go down to verse 20. And except that the Lord sh sh um, had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. But what? In the, the, the tribulation. Do y'all see what he's saying? Yeah. How did Matthew say it? Do y'all remember? Uh, no, 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 uh, not. He's, at the end of it. Amen. Matthew says after the tribulation. No, Mark doesn't say after. No, but the, the point I'm focusing on, Matthew doesn't say what Mark is saying here. That's why I'm saying this. Matthew says after the tribulation. Mark says in the tribulation. Yeah. No, I, I, yes, I agree Mark is saying that, but the point I want to focus on is in the tribulation. That If we don't see this, we don't have no starting point for the first sign. That's that's what I'm. That's what I'm. Amen. No. All right. This is why it's important to go back to our pioneers. This is not. Mark is saying after the tribulation, because in 1773 persecution almost what? That's what Mark is talking about. That's the point I was trying to make. Yeah. So that's what I was saying. So when we go here to Mark, Matthew is bringing us down to 1798. But Mark is the one that says in those days after the tribulation. And the tribulation almost ceased in 1773. That's what Mark is pointing to. That's the time he's talking to. He's saying in this, after it ceased, so we should see persecution almost wholly ceased. And then immediately following that, the first sign. Matthew is not giving you that record. Instant. Matthew is taking you down to 1798 because there's one more sign that we got to look for that doesn't happen in the 1260. Matthew says, at the end of the tribulation, Matthew says, there shall be signs in the sun, moon, and so Matthew is also pointing to 1773 because he says at the end you will see those three signs. Mark gives us a little better explanation as to if we still in the 1260. I think they're saying the same thing. I just think. Mark gives you a little more detail, whereas Matthew says, after the tribulation, signs, and he lists the three signs. So Matthew, ha I have to see those signs after persecution ceases. That's, that's how I read that. Okay, well, I just wanted to, to catch this point that Mark is take, putting us in the 1260, and I'll encourage us to just go read what our pioneers have to say on some of these things. But Mark is putting us in the 1260, and I don't want anyone to miss this point. He's putting us in the 1260 to look for this first sign. And this is the next thing that we're about to read in reference to, to that. It says, Now as the time of the appearance of, those, of these signs, it was to be immediately after the tribulation that in the sun was to be darkened. As Mark records, it was to be in those days after that tribulation. Our Savior had said that the day should be shortened by the decree of Maria Theresa and the acts of toleration from 1773 to 1776, the rage of persecution against the church was shortened. Although the persecuting power retained control of the civil arm until 1798, its persecution were closed about 1773. Comparing the statements of the Savior would place the first of these signs between 1773 and 1798. That's why I was saying that. That's what Mark gives us. Amen? That's, that's what I want to see. This is, Mark gives us this immediate place to look for it by saying, in those days. Um, let me, I'm not saying Matthew doesn't do that because Matthew does list 
the signs. Matthew says there shall be signs in the heavens and in the suns and in the stars. But some would read that and try to place the stars in that time. But by going to what um, Mark is saying, Mark gives us a definite place in order to look for the first sign. He says, in those days when the tribulation is shortened, then you now look for this sign. And on July 21st, 1773, the 21st of July, nations began to suppress the Jesuit power. The Jesuits was raised up to persecute the Protestants. And in 1773, they passed a decree, the papal bull of 17, July 21st, 1773, which suppressed Jesuits all throughout Europe. And therefore, the Rome's hands was kind of tied in persecuting Christians. And seven years after that, they saw the first sign. The sun was darkened and the moon didn't give its light, just like how Christ said it, said that it would happen. And why is that important? Because when you go look that up in history, till this day, there is no scientific, scientific explanation for that dark day. The sun just went dark in the middle of the day. It was already shining, and then just like that, it, the light just stopped. Just like that. Why did, why did that do that? Why did Christ do it that way? I t so you can't what? Amen. And so that you would what? Believe. I told you these things before it comes to pass so that you might what? You might believe. Ellen White says unmistakable signs was given. It couldn't be mistaken that this was supernatural. It had nothing to do with natural law. There was no eclipse. There was no eclipse whatsoever. The sun just literally went dark for three whole days. And that was, what, that was the first sign that Christ gave um, to, to, to the Christians at that time. And Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I wanted to move. And it says, and when these things begin to come to pass, now here's what Christ says, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. And he spake to them a parable, behold the fig tree and all the trees, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that the summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. And I want to bring this part out. Notice the signs that he says that, are, that these are the ones he's given to begin to look for his coming. What were the two of them? What were, what were they? Uh, where are these? In the heavens. Where are they? In the heavens. So where do we have to look for the signs of his coming? Well, the Nothing on earth. Y'all follow? Nothing on earth is, is going to let us. Yes, the events that happen on earth, but Christ gave specific things to let us know when he is coming in heaven. Amen? Amen. He says, look where? Look up, down. not down. Look up. This is where you look for the signs, up there. And he says it's the sun, moon, and stars. And why is, I, I, I don't have time to go through this, but these were what? Natural, right? Amen. They're delineating something else. Because when you look up the definition of sign, this was really nice when you look up the, de the meaning of sign. And I'm just going to read one. Just look up what sign means. We probably have an idea in our minds, but it's best to look up what it actually means. One of his meaning is, a, it's not in your notes. A token, something by which another thing is shown or represented. Any visible thing, any motion, appearance, or event which indicates the existence or approach of something else. So the sun, moon, and stars is evidence of what? Something else. They're representing, like Swindon said, something else. So when you naturally see this, you should naturally be looking for something else. Amen. That's what a sign is, but here's another meaning of sign that I like the most. It says a sign is a memorial or a monument. So these signs that Christ gave, what are they? Monuments. Memorials and they're monuments. You can't move them. They're there for a reason. They serve a purpose. They serve to help his people. When they look over the sea of time, they will see that they've passed the way mark that indicates to them that we've reached this point in history and we need to prepare for that thing which this sign indicates that is going to happen. Amen? Or yes, January 6th. It's a change of government. That's what I want to come to. Yes, amen. Yes. Amen. That, that's a form of it. That's a form of it. But here's another definition for sign. A memorial or monument, something to preserve the memory of a thing. What is the Sabbath? The sign. What is designed to preserve? Creation. The memory of creation. Sabbath heals the mind. When we keep the Sabbath, we're actually healing our memory. 
So when the papacy instituted Sunday, what is it actually doing? Destroying the mind. So when the Sunday law comes and those who receive the mark of the beast, they've literally committed suicide. Yeah, yeah, they've destroyed themselves. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. And when you get into the time when God pours out a place, do you know what one of those places is going to be? A loss of your mind. Mm -hmm. Those who keep the Sabbath are asking God to preserve their mind. Amen? Mm -hmm. The Sabbath has a very powerful thing to it, attached to it, that we need to understand. It's a sign, God says. It's a memorial that he has set up as an indicator to let us know where we are in time. The keeping of the Sabbath preserves our understanding of time. That's what it does. It's all about time. So the Lord, when we keep the Sabbath, we will have a good understanding of God's creative power and redemptive power that he's done in this earth. Amen? All right, so go back to our notes. That's just a little side note on there. Hopefully one day I'll, get to, I'll be able to develop it. Yeah, it's coming. Okay, so we just went through that with Luke and... Um, Christ says, verse 30, when they now shoot forth, ye see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, ye, when ye see these things come to pass, know ye that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. All right. So remember, when you see these things come to pass, you know the kingdom is near at hand. And uh, I'm going <coughs> to go past this again. And let's take a look. Matthew says this. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. I'm going to jump past this. Christ uses the fig tree as an illustration to, 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 um, to represent the signs. When you see fig tree, it lets you know that summer is near. So when you see the first sign of the darkening of the sun, that's, I should have separated them right here for this purpose. When you see the first sign, this is the first sign. The first sign. And the stars fall. This is the last sign. It's only two. This is the last sign that indicates that he's coming. So Christ uses the fig tree to represent these two signs. He says, when you see the fig tree, when it shoot forth, what does it tell you? Summer is near. Okay, but in order for the fig tree to shoot forth, it, all the signs must happen. Y'all follow? Yes. They must both happen. So when these both signs, we're going to read it. Here's what Christ says. Um, he says, when you, when you see all these things, then know. Amen? That's what he says. So let's look at this quote. It says, Christ has given signs of his coming. He declares that we may what? No. Know when it, he is near, even at the doors. He says, of the, he says of those who see these things, these signs, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. These signs have what? How many how, signs, singular or plural? plural. Two, right? Because that's what Christ gave, sun and the moon and the stars. And we're going to see that. I know he gave a list of things, but it's really only two that lets us know his coming is near. It's the darkening of the sun and the falling of the stars. That's what he's given to us in Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 21, to let, he, let him know is yet coupled with teaching. Because once he says the parable of the fig tree, he says, now learn. Amen. So when the two signs come to pass, that's the time to learn about his second coming. That's what I'm coming to. And, and the men who lived in that time, they understood this perfectly well. They recognized that, man, Christ is really coming, and this is the time to start teaching that he's really about to come. So now let's look at this next one. These signs have appeared. Now we know of a surety that the Lord's coming is at hand. Um, go, let's go over to this next one now. In 1833, two years after Miller began to present in public the evidences of Christ's soon coming, the what? The last, the song. The last what? The last what was the first one? The darkening dark of the sun and the moon. And the last one was the stars. So, at, um, let's continue. Which were promised by the Savior as tokens of his second coming, said Jesus, the stars shall fall from heaven. And John in the Revelation declared as he beheld in vision the scenes that should herald the day of God, the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. This prophecy received a striking and impressive fulfillment in the great meteoric shower of November 13, 1833. They have never ever seen anything like this in his, till this day, there hasn't been another one like it. Y'all follow? There's never been one like this day um, in, in, and say it again. Before or after. 
before or after. And not only did it happen on November 13, it also happened on November 25th, 25th in Europe. It happened twice, so naturally. So the Lord allowed the stars to fall like it has never fallen before. And Miller, at the same time, the same time they fell, there was a preacher. In, in Europe, yes, but yes. specifically for this one, the preacher is linked with that star. Yes, there was preacher. Yes, it's in the United States. It's the one in Europe, their day is past. So this one is primarily, like Swinton said, is for America. It's for Protestant America. That's, that's what this sign is, is for. So going back, going on to our next note. So in 1833, the last of the sign was given. So remember, it was two that Christ says. But the question I was asked, why is the stars the last sign? When he says, and then shall they see the Son of Man coming in, in, in the heavens. Why is the stars the last one? One of the things we have to understand, the Lord really wants us to be very deep students of prophecy. And um, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, if anyone studies it, it actually helps us to study the Bible. And what it does in studying the Bible, what it shows us is that prophecy is history in advance. And Matthew 24 has given us historical records of things that happen in history. But I want us to see that Christ, he gives you a piece, he takes you to the fallen, to the dark day in 1780. So he doesn't give a year. He just tells you to mark the time when that sign appears. So this year now becomes a, a memorial year. It becomes a year of, to, for us to remember because this is when that sign appeared. And then Christ takes the minds of the Christians down to 1833. One, there's many things this is showing us. One is showing us that Jesus is aware of everyone where they are living in all time. Amen? It's showing us that. He's aware of all of his people no matter what time they're living it. And because he's aware of his people, he gives them comfort by letting them know that he's aware of them, by giving them, giving them these signs to watch for that would comfort them in the hour in which they live. So failing to look for these signs, we're not going to receive the comfort Christ really wants us to receive. And, and w another thing that this does, Matthew 24 and Mark 13 and Luke 21, it teaches the Christians to keep an eye, a, a watchful eye for the signs of the times. It teaches us how to read the, the events that are taking place around us. That's what it's designed to do, because if we don't keep our eye on the events, like I was saying about the gold-covered blocks, that Satan puts a, 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 a paint over 1780. He puts a paint over 1833. He puts a paint over 1798. He hides the, these facts, these records from people so that they would not be moved to prepare or recognize that they're even living in the last days. So when you saw these two signs, this was a sign that, man, we are in the last days. So the generation that saw those things, what do you think they were going to do? They were going to live like they were really in the last days. And that's why William Miller came up and his message was with power because he believed the sign that Christ gave them. They really believed it on um, the falling of the stars and all these things. Now let's um, look at this. Why is it the last sign? She takes us to John. She says John spoke of the same thing. And in Revelation chapter 6, verse 13, it says, And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she's shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. What is this a sign of? The second coming. So the last thing you see after the stars is it takes you where? So how many history is Christ jumping over? Many history. He's going from the falling of the stars and he's immediately going down to the second coming. So the, the, the pioneers of that time recognize then the last sign that anyone will see just before Christ comes is the falling of the stars. Y'all follow? This is the last thing that Christ gives to us to let us know we're in the end. It's not that there's other signs. Matthew 24 is designed to show us the destruction of Jerusalem. <coughs> yes, amen. Takes you down to the end of the world. Um, GC says, Thus was displayed the last of those signs of his coming concerning which Jesus bade his disciples. When you shall what? See all these things, what? Know that it is near. So, Remember, what is a sign? It's a memory. So when we come to recognize that 1780 fulfilled prophecy, and when we come to recognize that 1833 fulfilled prophecy, it's intended that we who are reading this, we now know and recognize we are truly where? In the last, In the last days. days. Because these are the signs for the last days. 
and not understanding these natural signs that took place, this is why we're unable to recognize like what Swinton was saying earlier about January 6th in the United States. How is that connected to these signs? Y'all are following? Because the government is the what? Is the heavens. And how can we prove from the Bible that the government is the heaven? Can anyone give me a quick story that illustrates that? Romans who? Revelation 8. I thought we was going to go to the easiest one with Joseph and his dream, where he says his father was the sun and his mother was the moon and the children was the stars. Amen. The father was the king of the home. The mother was the church and the children are the citizens of the kingdom and the church. Y'all follow? So you have the father, the priest, the mother, the, the, the one in the church that takes care of it and then the children that works in the church. But you have the father, the ruler. And you have the mother, the, the, like a head representative that makes sure the government is running the way it should. And you have the children, the citizens of that government. That's what was being illustrated all in that story of Joseph. All of that. Both church and what? And state. That's what that story is illustrating to us. And the Lord used the, the natural sun, moon, and stars as figures to represent governments and nations. Say Amen. These shall rule in the heavens. Amen. So that's why when these understanding these natural signs, they're a message that Christ intends that we hear when these things happen. And if we can recognize the, these natural signs, we will be able to recognize the spiritual manifestations of these signs to give us an indication, man, we're getting closer and closer to the second coming. Amen. That's why it's very important to understand that these things actually took place in history. By not understanding this, this is why we can't see the future today or the present, I should say, the present today, or have a better understanding of what's going to happen in the future. And now I want to read this next quote where it says, Thus was displayed the last of those signs of his coming. I read that. Then know that it is near, even at the doors. After these signs, John beheld as the great event next impending, the heavens departed as a scroll. While the earth quaked, mountains and islands were moved out of their places, and the wicked in terror sought to flee from the presence of the Son of Man. Yes, amen. Yes, amen. Shaking. Amen. The distress of nations. Yeah. Then all the people were led to heed the warning. Amen. Amen. And that's what Christ intended the people to do. Amen. And this is what we're now about to. This has not lost its power. This, this, this truth, the, the old truths have not lost their force and power because they were not intended for the people at that time. They're intended for the people who are literally living in the time when Christ is really about to come. Amen. Amen. This is his, his intention, is designed to remember what I said. When you see the block turn to gold after you put it in the fire and gold is manifest, your desire for the, for the remainder of the blocks should go up. So when we see prophecy come to pass that God has indicated, our desire to live a Christian life should go up. Mm -hmm. Amen? That's what it's designed to do. It says, many who witnessed the falling of the stars, 1833, looked upon it as a herald of the coming judgment, an awful type, a sure forerunner, a merciful sign of that great and dreadful day. Thus the attention of the people were directed to the fulfillment of prophecy, and many were led to give heed to the warning of the second advent. This is what happened in 1833. Many were led to give heed um, to this warning. And let us continue with this, um, this next part, we, um, this next quote. As the inhabitants of, um, I really like this quote um, for this reason. She's, she um, is now going to take the time of the antediluvians that they were given signs it they were supposed to know when the flood was near not only did god tell them when the flood um not only got did god give them signs that there was a coming flood but he actually told them when the flood was going to come yes it, he told them he said noah 120 days which is 120 years and noah preached to the people for 120 years but like swindon said enoch told them the flood was going to come how do i know that jew tells me Enoch prophesied of the coming of Christ. So Enoch was prophesying alongside Noah, warning the people that Christ was going to come. Enoch understood that the flood was a type of the second coming. Because when Christ comes, he confirmed it by saying, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. 
He, Christ used the flood to illustrate his second coming. So Enoch used the teaching of the flood to illustrate to the minds of the people that this represents Christ's second coming. That's why Jude can say Enoch prophesied of Christ's second coming. Before the flood even came, Enoch understood that the flood was a type of Christ's second coming. Y'all follow? Amen. That's the kind of spirit Christians should have. We should see what God is doing, but also see what he's pointing to later on in the future, just like Enoch. Amen? Amen. He walked with God, so we are to walk with God. We have the same opportunity like he did. To walk. Yes, amen. It was, amen. 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 Yes, they were. Because Enoch named his son Methuselah. And the meaning of Methuselah, what, is it, what does it mean? When he dies, the flood comes. And Methuselah was the longest living man in this earth. He lived for 969 years. And literally, the year he died, what happened? The flood came. The year he died, his whole life was t teaching the people the flood is coming. And here's how the Lord tested them. 120, um, Methuselah died. 120 came. Did the flood come immediately? No, it took seven days. God allowed the people to manifest themselves that they really hated the message of Noah. And they began to mock. That's why Christ says, as it was in his days, so shall it's going to be in our days. So what is that saying? The Lord is going to delay his coming. The stars fell. Why didn't Christ come? Because just like them, he delayed it to reveal the characters of those who say they're Christians and are not. Y'all follow? And we now have, like Noah, Noah held on to his faith because he was sure the flood was coming. So we are to hold on to our faith. Christ is really coming. Peter tells us in the last days, when the stars fall, mockers are going to come and say, where's the promise of his coming? Since the, since the days of our fathers, all things continued as they are. Peter, why is Peter saying that? And then Peter immediately goes to the prophecy of the flood because that's what they did in the flood. Mm -hmm. Because they did not count God's long suffering. God is willing that what? Nobody should perish. If we don't recognize this, what would happen to us? We would perish. So the Lord allows time to go on to give people living in the last days an opportunity to recognize that the signs that Christ promised to give us were already given. Amen. We're going to come to that. That's our next presentation. I'm trying to set that up for that. Ten minutes. Thank you. I'm at the end anyway. So going on, it says, As the inhabitants of the antediluvian world knew not the time in which they were living, so the inhabitants of the world today, what? Know not. Why? Because they what? They do not choose to know that they are living where? In the last days. Christ has warned us to look for his second coming. So wait a minute. So everyone who doesn't know, why don't they know? They're choosing not to know the, 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 the signs that indicates that we're in the last days. My people, Hosea 4, 6, are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they what? They rejected knowledge. And <clears throat> coming down, I want to read this. It says, coming down in this line of prophecy, past the fulfillment of the third sign, the falling of the stars, our Savior says, now learn a parable of the fig tree. Jump down to the next bowl. But to the generation that was to see these things fulfill, not fulfilling, but what? Fulfilled. But fulfilled. The things to be fulfilled as tokens that Christ is at the door do not include the shaking of the heavens when he will be seen actually coming. These signs of his near coming include this third sign. This one in the stars, the Lord's appointed time for the people to what? So the falling of the stars is God's what? Appointed time to learn. And that's why I said William Miller. Right where the stars fell, what did the people have? A preacher. Amen. Time come. Praise God. Amen. 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 Going on, it says, The Lord's appointed time for the people to learn a parable of the fig, tr fig tree dates this side of 1833. Here is the Lord's time for the world to be aroused to the great truth that his coming is at the doors, and that his coming will be before the generation who hear that parable shall pass away. So we see how the time is what? Marked out in this prophecy when the great advent proclamation should be given to the world. And this is the sign of the first angel's message. Amen. Amen. That's the first. And this gospel shall be preached where? In all the world for a witness and what? 
Then shall the end come. So why hasn't it come? Because this gospel didn't finish his work. It didn't finish his work. It only came as an introduction to the people in the world to let them know you have reached the time when Christ is getting ready to come. And you better prepare yourself for this coming because ready or not, he is going to come. But the reason why he has not come is because many are not acquainted with these signs. They're not acquainted with it. And in God's long suffering, he's suffering long to make the world acquainted with these signs so that he can prepare himself to really come and deliver his people. Amen. So going on says in this scripture, our attention is directed to the time when it is possible to learn that the coming of Christ is at the doors with the same assurance that we not, we know that summer is near when we see the first tender young leaves put in forth. It may also be known that we have come to the generation which shall not pass off the stage of action until Christ himself shall come. When the time comes to learn the parable, it is emphatically true that it is the Lord's time to raise up teachers to teach the parable. The inquiry of the apostle on another occasion is equally applicable here. How shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? And this we're at the end of this part. And Amos says, Amos, looking down to that time, says, prepare to meet thy God. Amen. That's what these signs are intended to do, to prepare us to, to meet the Lord. The only reason why things haven't rapidly reached to where they, God intends them to reach, because his people are not yet prepared for these things. And as a result of not preparing, the Lord delays his coming. And remember what Wesley said. The longer God delays, the worse the judgments are going to be. Y'all are following? Remember I started, he bottled up the wrath that should have came upon the fathers, but they didn't come. So the Lord reserves the last, the last of his wrath for the last generation where he's going to pour it out. So in other words, the longer his people takes to prepare themselves and do the work that was appointed them, Preach the gospel. Make the world acquainted with these signs. Let the world know that these memorable things, the darkening of the sun, this thing, scientists, till this day, they can't explain it. They can't explain why the sun went dark in 1780 and why the moon didn't give us light, why the moon turned blood red. For three straight days, there was no cloud. There was no eclipse. There was nothing. The sun just literally went dark. And till this day, they don't know how. In 1833, the stars fell like they've never fallen before. Till this day, scientists still can't explain why that has taken place. But Christ can. Christ says, I'm giving you these things as a sign that you're in the last days and I'm getting ready to come. So prepare yourselves to meet me. And I'm giving you this time from the moment that you see it to get yourself ready for my second coming. Amen. That's the reason for this. And this is what we have to acquaint the people with. Um, with these messages at the end of the world. And in our next presentation, we're going to look at another sign that Christ gave us as an indicator, not, not for everyone per se, but specifically, especially for those who understand his seventh day Sabbath and the issues at the end of the world. Amen. You got that look, it was a sign. And you're shaping and up. you probably do something like, you know, whatever. That was a sign for you. But in waiting, you had often time. Amen. To correct yourself. To, not only to correct, but to repent, to go over it, to think about what you did, and to accept the punishment. Amen. It's coming. And so the Millerite or a young church, their father only gave them that look. They got the look. And now we are the ones at the back end who is on the way home. And when we get to that point, we know that our Father is just going to bring the wrath. So it is up to us to accept the punishment, repent of the sins of our fathers, and get ready for that time. Amen. Amen. The one who's on our tails that's hindering us from getting ready is none other than the great deceiver, Amen. right? Which is Satan. He's the one that's preventing us from preparing ourselves. As I said, the gold. What is the gold? the fulfillment of prophecy. All these fulfillment are gold. They're gold to the Christian. When we recognize that these things actually took place in history and that the Bible prophesied of these things taking place, Christ intends that we take hold of the rest of the gold, the rest of the things that he said is going to be fulfilled all the way up to his second coming. Amen? Amen. He wants us to take hold of those things. We should now be assured, oh man, 
Everything Christ said here is really true, and they're really going to happen. And now we should sit down with our Bibles and ask him, just like the disciples at the beginning of Matthew 24, Lord, what, is, what shall be the sign? Christ answered them. So I believe if we sit down with our Bible, Lord, explain these signs to me. I believe he's going to answer us. And we will begin to see, man, we're truly at the end of the world. There's many other things we're going to bring in, and hopefully in the next presentation, we hope, I, I want us to see how much more closer the sign comes to us. Amen? It comes even closer to us in the next presentation. We should have recognized something long ago. We should have seen it. But because we allowed Satan to cover prophecy fulfilled with paint, and we don't go to God's word to fire to burn off the dross so that we can see that, that goal and take hold of it, that's what happens. We are, if we don't go, the, the prophecy says we are choosing what? Not to know. Amen. We're choosing not to know. They're plainly revealed. They're not, they're not mistaken. Christ didn't put these things in figures. He plainly says, sun's going to darken. Stars are going to fall. He plainly said that. And it literally happened literally the way he said it. And it's intended to make us literally prepare ourselves. Amen. So let us close out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you for your great mercy. We want to thank you, O Lord, for giving us signs by which we can know exactly where we are in time. And just like you've given the, the, the men of old time and space to repent, you gave them 120 years, O oh Lord, to, to, to put away their evils, to put away the evil of their doings and prepare themselves for the flood. So you're giving us time to put away the evils of our doing and prepare ourselves for the second coming. Please help us to understand. Please enlighten our minds. And I pray and ask, O oh Lord, that you continue to, to sow seeds of truths in our heart and that you water these seeds, O oh Lord, so that they may grow and, and bear fruit unto your name. Please continue to be with us and, and prepare our hearts, O oh Lord, for the next presentation we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.